The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So, I am pretty quick. Uh, just so folks know what's coming and you know when what questions will be answered. I'm going to talk a little bit about where patents have come from, very quick gloss over stuff that most of you likely know, a bit on the what's changed in the last year or two, or you know, more recently trends that have come to light, and then we're going to jump right into solutions that are being proposed and what kinds of solutions are out there and um, which ones are realistic, which are not, in my opinion, your mileage may vary, um, especially if you're you know, wealthy, there's a lot more options there. Uh, so if you, have, if you see something and you have a solution and you're like, let's get Superman and pitchforks and just let, hold that till we get to the solution part. So, because um, I know it's, it's the, when I lay out the problem, the, the tendency is to be like, oh, why can't they just, but I'm gonna ask you to hang on to that until we get to that point. Okay, so uh, where do patents come from? That's We have this situation where we're issuing approximately 40,000 software patents a year. And that is, um, I wanna make sure I get this number correct, uh, compare that with 20,000 patents, software patents a year just 10 years ago, and only around 5,000 per year in 1990. So that's that kind of a number. So we have lots, lots and lots and lots of software patents. And lots of other patents too, but we're gonna focus on software patents, particularly here in the US today. Um, so before we get to who is applying for those patents and what they're doing with them and all that sort of thing, um, I wanna just address the concept of innovation. So we hear a lot of like, oh, it spurs innovation, our company is, innovative, innovation, 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 right? So there's a couple of different things that are meant by that term. It comes from the Latin root uh, new, nova. Um, and so sometimes when you hear someone talking about innovation, they actually mean a new invention. But sometimes they actually just mean a new business model or just a new way of thinking about stuff. So we might think about, um, the innovative thinker would say, you know, I bet if we made that thing more aerodynamic, it would go faster. You have the inventor who actually figures out how to make it more aerodynamic, builds a more aerodynamic version, and has a physical thing to show you. And then you have a monetizer that says, as soon as that thing goes faster, we can charge them more for it. So when we talk about the goodness of innovation, um, remember to try and unpack that term and think about which type we're talking about, because you, you don't want to be moved to a particular policy stance um, unless you really know what spurring innovation means in that instance. Um, so patents, products, or ideas. And those are kind of all three different things. Um, patents traditionally were on physical devices that solved a problem that had a series of steps that implemented a solution to that problem. So, you know, the cotton gin, people like to talk about that. It's a physical thing, there's a problem. We're not ginning cotton, I'm not sure quite what ginning cotton is, but it's very good. And uh, that was the problem. We invented a device, you like we invented a device to make that more efficient. So, um, and it, you know, so it's a, you got a patent on a thing, there was a product. I'm sure there was an idea before there was a product. Uh, Right now, we have a problem in that software is more of an idea than it is a, a device. So is it a product? Like, yes, you can sell it, but it's not a device. You have this other kind of, like, well, where does it go? So software is a, a kludgy fit at best for patents, uh, if you think they should be patented at all. Uh, but we have a situation where you have a rise in what's called functional claiming, and that's a legal term that means um, I can patent the idea of I solve this problem. So you identify the problem, you say I think that we should solve this problem, and then 
for current patents on software, the implementation step has been replaced with, well, a lot of legal verbiage that boils down to comma on a computer. So instead of building an actual physical product or uh, naming a whole number of steps, all of those steps in a lot of the more egregious and frivolous patents boil down to comma on a computer. If you, if you are a developer and you understand the field, you look at all those steps and you say, those are all things that computers just do. You haven't really implemented your idea for solving a problem. So that is why we have these suits that we hear about and we're like, they, they patented what? So like the Microsoft file allocation table patent where that was the brilliant idea that you have a short file name that you use sometimes and a long file name that you use other times to save room. Um, that was a patent that was litigated on. So it was like, oh, we have this problem where we have like not enough space. And then I, I say we fix that problem by using short file names and long ones. But it wasn't really an inventive thing. Computers are already capable of understanding abbreviations. So, or, you know, two names for pointing at the same location in memory, right? So. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, great. So, um, so what's going on? More money, more problems. Uh, these are things that people largely know. Folks have, you know, either read Ars Technica or Tech Dirt or Slash God or something, right? And have probably seen some of these things. Uh, a lot of money, that's not a secret. Uh, activity is increasing, not decreasing. Uh, lobsters are not spurring innovation unless we are counting innovation by the number of patents that are uh, being issued. Uh, and uh, developers are not enjoying the situation. Just to give you some numbers to hang that on, um, this is uh, James Beckton is at Boston University. He wrote a paper in 2011 where he said that he estimated the annual wealth lost from MP, that's non-practicing entities or trolls, uh, was about 80 billion. So, that's money that went on the floor. The actual trolls got in about nine or 10% of that money. The rest was just lost revenue. And that's in terms of culminating stock prices, uh, lost opportunities to bring something to market, um, spending people's attention instead of on making new products that would make them more money on a lawsuit that they were fighting, all of those kinds of things. The legal fees are actually just a small chunk of that. So $80 billion in potential wealth on the floor so that a non-practicing entity or troll can get about $8 billion. Those are giant numbers, those are, you know, so, but um, I would say that's not for any reason. Um, this is the activity increasing 2001. Uh, patent suits involving NPEs. Something about 70 or 80 percent of those suits are on software. They also like the business method patents because they're also real nice and vague and can allow you to bring a lawsuit and um, find a lot of people doing the same type of thing. So you kind of just cut and paste your uh, your scary letter to like the next person and the next person. But um, this is uh, this is kind of that's that's the whoo, scary numbers that we're looking at. Um, so and then the part where it's kind of a PICA. Um, Avoiding fake ads through ready code, pulling out features, it's time consuming, it's unfun. I don't really need to beat that into the ground with this audience, I think, right? Okay, great. Um, so uh, on the more recent developments, uh, the patent aggression entities are getting bigger. Um, we have now what we would call like a massive aggregator. Instead of like one person who has just a handful of patents litigating on it, we have massive organizations. Uh, the target, oops, uh, targets are getting smaller, and then I'll talk about the type of suits. Um, intellectual ventures, has everyone kind of heard of intellectual ventures? Yep, okay. 1,300 shell companies at intellectual ventures. That's 1,300 affiliated organizations or incorporated entities. Uh, there's a fella in Russia, he, uh, he built software. He got a letter from a company that is incorporated in the U.S. that said like, and it was a nice letter, it was like, hey, it looks like you're building, you know, you also are using this thing that we have a patent on, but you know, like we, we want to be nice and friendly, maybe you just want to sign a nice little 
little craft licensing deal with us and just send us a little bit of your profit and you know then we don't have to sue or anything so that was like kind of a nice patent troll letter and then he just was like that just sounds ridiculous he ignored the letter so then he got another letter from the mean patent <laughs> aggressive entity and uh, and there it said if you don't stop using that right away we're going to sue you for everything and then he was like still trying to figure out what to do with this US company, got this letter. So then he had another letter from the nice patent aggression enemy that said like, hey, we own this patent, and don't forget if you cross license, then you have something uh, to protect you from being sued by other companies. So he thought, wow, all right. He wrote to the FBI and said, I think I've been contacted by a racketeering organization. <laughs> And the FBI was like, well, actually, they're all legal corporations in the US. Uh, so we can't help you. <laughs> so that's, um, that's the kind of thing that is enabled by having that number of shell corporations. Uh, it's pretty gross. Uh, I loads of stories. I'll, I'll, link to, I'll show you guys um, a, a paper that you might want to look at if you want to get angrier about intellectual ventures at the end. Um, and so, um, as far as the types of suits, uh, what we have now is where uh, instead of just the makers of technology being sued, they're suing the customers. And the reason that this happens is because patent trolls don't have any customers. They don't care if every user of that software in the world despises them because they are never going to have any customers because they're not shipping anything. So they will just blow out the market and piss off every customer of some particular technology and then just move on to something else. You know, not caring that they've left this wake of people who are like, well, never using that kind of software again. Uh, so that's pretty dangerous. And uh, they also tend to be less likely to fight. They settle at a higher rate because they're like, we don't really know what that means and it sounds really scary and we hired out like to have our software written. so. Uh, all right, and they hit them with a lower number, so it's kind of like, well, all right, you know. So it's a, it is a little bit more, you know, like an old mobster movie, right? Uh, and that's, uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing. We're also seeing suits deeper at the stack level, so instead of like on one little piece, it'll be like something deep in the kernel that uh, can't be just pulled out and be like, all right, screw it, I'm not using that anymore. And so that is a, um, deterring innovation, not on like the specific bits and pieces on the top, like in a moving target kind of way, but in like whole categories of devices and software. So like, like that file allocation table or um, the accident patent, which got overturned, or um, the one that is on the NPR show where they're talking about uh, remote backups. So like stuff that's really integral to it's a computer, of course it does that, uh, as opposed to, you know, using, uh, taking a picture of your face and using it as your icon, which, like, if someone sued you on that, you'd just be like, we just won't do that anymore, whatever. So, um, solutions. The great thing about all of these egregious stories and these, like, ridiculous numbers is that many, many, many people have spent a lot of the last few years, like, figuring out, like, what can we do about this? Um, and I'm going to go over a couple of different the categories, uh, judicial, legislative, um, policy, and community. So, uh, but before we go there, I want to make sure that everyone understands what's currently on the books because a lot of times when I talk about this, and then, so that's why this section is here, so we be like, well, let's just make it illegal to patent math. Um, the patentable subject matter already does not include math. It's, it is already illegal to patent math. So that is on the books. What happens is a, a sort of a weird dance with the verbiage where you say, like, I'm going to solve this problem, I'm going to do these different steps, using an algorithm as one part of a bunch of like legalese kind of steps. Um, you're not supposed to be able to patent the math by itself. So that's already on the books. Um, it also means you're supposed to have stuff that, uh, you didn't just find someone else using it and then go and be like, oh, I bet that, you know, Alex never patents stuff. I'm going to go and patent this stuff. 
So you're already not supposed to be able to do that. The problem is, is that the USPTO doesn't really know where to look for prior art and software. For a lot of the more traditional engineering fields with physical products, they have a number of different academic journals in different areas. If you are in charge of uh, that particular category of physical product, you subscribe to the relevant journals and you know what's new, what's coming down the pipe, what people are thinking about, and you know exactly what to grant patents on and what not. Maybe, maybe not exactly, I'm sure people have grants in other areas, but um, for the most part, there is a central place to look for prior art. Software, not so much. You might be like, oh, why aren't they on GitHub? Um, how many of you have seen enough comments on software that you actually know what's being done on everything in your projects, right? Assuming that they wanted to actually lurk uh, tens of thousands of projects on GitHub. So we're not doing a great job of organizing prior art and they don't know where to look. So that's why we end up with patents on stuff that is actually not new. Uh, it's also supposed to not be obvious. So um, it means, that means that it can't be obvious to someone in that field. It doesn't matter if it's not obvious to someone outside the field. Um, has anyone here ever made a basket? I went to like hippie summer camp. Okay. Um, so the freeze underwater basket weaving, what do you picture there, right? It's, it's not the person underwater, it's the basket. But it sounds weird if you say like, oh yeah, we're going to spend our Saturday doing some underwater basket weaving. And everyone's like, that is, what the heck? But if you've woven a basket before, you know that's the default because it keeps all the strands of wicker pliable. So to an actual basket maker, they would say, no way, you cannot patent underwater basket weaving. That's all the basket weaving. So what we're having a problem here with in software is that people don't know what the equivalent of everything that's done underwater is for software. So we're getting patents on stuff that is pretty simple if you are at a person who's in that field. Um, that's not the way it's supposed to be, but that is what that means, unfortunately. Uh, and then it's also supposed to have utility and be possible. Like you can't just travel, you can't just say like, I patent time travel, or I patent flying with unicorns, or I, I patent uh, telepathy with magnets. So um, those things are already not patentable. So judicial. Uh, the trick with the courts, we need, uh, we could try and impact the courts. That means we'd have to, you know, send suits up um, and, uh, and pay legal fees. So it's uh, not exactly cheap. The great thing about a solution that went through the courts is that it would affect all of the current patents on the books. Uh, other solutions would only affect patents that are granted going forward and we still have 20 years of uh, bad patents that have already been issued. So the courts could decide, we change the law right now. They tend to be kind of timid, but you know, enough suits maybe they would. Uh, so we would ask them to, or push them, to set precedent that better upholds the existing statute, which is the stuff that we just talked about. And in some places, we're starting to see glimmers of hope that they might do that. The um, CLS Bank versus Alice case was about a month ago uh, was the idea that you have one person here and one person here and they're doing business, a whole lot of different transactions, and you have a third party manage their uh, relationship and the money going back and forth. You could do that with pencil and paper, it just is easier on a computer. Uh, and so that was actually overturned. The court was like, you're right, that's non-patentable subject matter. A person could just sit and do that with pencil and paper. It doesn't matter how much fancy verbiage you put on it that you know, breaks down to on a computer, it still shouldn't be patentable subject matter, it's obvious. So it's great. Uh, what they decided not to do was to put too much in the opinion that gives us a uh, much wider, uh, you know, kind of verbiage to use that on other suits. So they, they could have said like, this one's not patentable and this whole other giant category of things, but in, instead they left it like kind of, you guys can just keep working them out case by case, so yeah. Um, we could lower the plaintiff's incentive to sue. There's a legislation also in that category talking about that. Um, where, and this is, this is pretty firmly targeted at trolls or non-practice communities where, uh, you know, we say like, instead of giving you 100% um, of the sales of this device based on one 
uh, invention that comprises maybe 2% of the actual device will actually just give you 2%. Or maybe we'll make you pay fees if it was a frivolous suit. So uh, we could set precedent that treat software patents differently than other patents. The courts did this recently with the uh, Prometheus versus Mayo case. Uh, but that was a medical method patent kind of thing. And um, I think they did that because there were sick people, actually, like sick people who didn't have much money in a public clinic actually getting sicker because of this patent. So I think when the courts see, like, oh, people are dying, they can be moved to be a little bit more reasonable, a little bit more quickly. Um, unfortunately, when they see Apple and Samsung slugging it out, they don't really see the, the puppies or the sick people that motivate them to get really deep in there. So, um, oh, was that the Okay, it is. So, legislative. There's a lot in here. We, we should pass a law for the children. Um, Congress is also not cheap. Uh, I don't know if people are aware of this. <laughs> um, Congressman, it is, it is really the best money you can buy. But, hmm? Yeah. Right. So, uh, look, and, and there's a lot in this section, and a lot of it from this past week. Uh, so the American Invents Act, we passed that in 2011. Uh, that did a couple of things, and it did do a couple of other things. It um, did first to file versus first to invent, so that harmonizes us with the rest of the world. It also means that if you uh, filed it first but didn't actually invent it, you get the patent. And so if there's prior art showing that someone invented it first, then you can go back and say they shouldn't have been granted that patent. But uh, you know, that's a, another problem, making sure that they can find that prior art. Uh, we decided you can't patent tax methods. This is a fancy way of saying you cannot cheat on your taxes and then patent the way you did it. The government hates when you steal from them. <laughs> um, so they, they made it so you can't patent that. Um, it expands the definition of prior art, so it, in harmonizing the first to file, first to invent with the rest of the world, we also said that we would look at, we would consider uh, sales and usage in other parts of the world uh, to be valid prior art or patents from other places. And then uh, what we didn't do was increase the funding for the U.S. Patent and Trade Office or change their structure. So a couple problems there. Um, the USPTO gets money when they grant a patent. That's like they're working on a commission. So that's obviously problematic. Uh, they're also underfunded and uh, only have uh, like something like 8 to 18 hours to look at each individual patent application. And that includes all of the administrative junk that goes along with any kind of work that is done in a giant bureaucracy like the US Patent and Trade Office. Um, and uh, we are in a place where we assume validity. So a patent is assumed to, a patent application is to assume to be valid until proven otherwise. So that's also, you can see how that might also be problematic. Um, I was going to do this all fancy and I just messed it up. But anyway, uh, American Events Act 2. So as many of you may have seen, uh, the president, or the White House, put out a press release just this week uh, with five executive actions and uh, seven legislative suggestions. Um, we all know how those legislative suggestions have been going. It's, I don't think if you get the current Congress to agree that savings around puppies is a good idea, just they would figure out a way to make it partisan. Uh, I don't know which side puppies go on them. Um, so uh, one of the things, this is, this piece, the real party in interest, is part of the executive order. It remains to be seen like how that will be enforced. But this basically says that when you file a patent suit, an infringement suit, you have to actually spell out who the real beneficiary is and who the real owner of the patent is. So uh, right now, remember the 1,300 shell corporations and intellectual ventures? Right. Um, until I guess we get a little wallet card where we can uh, reference them all. I mean, they'll just make more actually. But uh, if Intellectual Ventures is going to get 90% of the proceeds from that case, then they have to actually be named and publicly listed. 
Um, and then there's another thing about increased transparency. One of the things that makes uh, suit so difficult is that when you file uh, a case for an infringement and then people settle out of court, a lot of the uh, way that that gets kind of disposed of is they agree to never speak of it again. So if, um, if you sue 40 companies for patent infringement uh, and then the first one cracks and pays some amount of money, then the other 39 are not allowed to know like what you settled for. So they, they don't know if it's the most hugest number that was named or something uh, piddly or whatever. So um, this is to make it a matter of public record when these suits are filed so that everyone can kind of see who else was named. Um, so making injunctions harder and then the innocent user defense. So uh, these two ideas are sort of um, right now, one of the one of the first things that always happens when you say like you're infringing on my patent, the court says, okay, cool. So uh, defendant, stop shipping that stuff, and then sometime next year we'll figure out who really owns that patent and what's going on. So for software, that's like a whole year, which is just eons. And the injunction, this this kind of gets right to the heart of an anti-competitive suit. If you saw like you're doing something and your competitor is doing something and your competitor like figures out like wait yours is going to be done sooner and be cooler i sue you and then you have to wait a year while we sort it out in the courts and then a year later nobody cares because they all bought our jankier version anyway so making injunctions harder is pretty good um and then the innocent user defense this goes uh a lot of other countries have this on the books where you can't sue the user as opposed to the maker of the software. So that would be really good. That would get rid of a lot of the troll suits where like supermarkets and banks and um, pretty much anyone with a computer is getting sued. So, good times. Um, tightening functional claiming. I don't, so this is listed. I don't know how tight they're talking about. That's, this is just from this week and, and it remains to be seen. Um, some of the legislative suggestions are a sentence or two. I don't know if you've ever looked at legislation. It's, it's never a sentence or two. It's usually like 80 pages and it's, you know, it's written in that kind of language. So tightening functional claiming, that could be good. There is a little bit of precedent for that. Um, bioinformatics patents have a, a more tight uh, description of what uh, is being patented and then uh, they prescribe a scope of where the patents reach ends, just so you're not like patenting people and things like that. Um, and then uh, allowing the courts to punish frivolous litigators with fees by making them pay the um, defendant's law fees at the end. Like, oh, you never should have brought this case in the first place. You can pay the defendant's law, you know, lawyer fees. Um, so, allowing the courts to do that. There are a couple of instances where that's already done. Uh, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act act that way, uh, where uh, citizen groups bring lawsuits and then if they win, the uh, polluter pays for their fees. So, um, other legislative solutions. People would talk about, like, we should just get rid of patents altogether. Um, anyone that's familiar with the pharma industry? Right, yeah. Uh, this, this would be like taking on the Incredible Hulk while being swarmed by tigers. Um, getting rid of just software patents, more, more doable, but still, like I said, Congress isn't cheap. And a lot of companies already have tens of thousands of patents, like practicing entities and boards, you know, they're publicly traded companies, and they're like, those are assets that you can monetize. You can't, you can't push any kind of legislative solution that would get rid of that giant pile of potential money we bought. So um, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying it would be, it would be a lot of work and a lot of money. Um, and then there is already a piece of legislation floating around. This is like saving high-tech investors from egregious legal disputes. It's like a good little background there. Um, but yeah, again, this goes towards the troll problem specifically, more so than the anti-competitive suits, but, you know. Um, we could uh, raise patent or uh, maintenance fees. That could work, that's been floated. I think that could backfire also because it favors the, um, you know, the more money player in that market, so. 
Um, so policy solutions, like how come we're taking an hour out of our time developing Linux and Android and awesome software projects to talk about software patents, right? Um, so uh, there's a couple of different things we could consider. Uh, trying to get the USPTO to enforce the existing statute in a helpful way would be great, right? As we saw, the existing statute isn't all that bad. Um, so this is a, what we're talking about, the functional claiming problem, where you say, I have a solution, or I, I see a problem, I patent the idea of making a solution, um, come on a computer. And uh, so written description means you have to really say uh, what you're going to do, not like I'm going to fix it on a computer. It really has to be like how, really what are you going to do? Um, and then definiteness is the legal term for saying I describe the scope of the patent and it's, it, it only goes this far. So the thing where the remote backup patent where they are arguing that means any kind of remote backup whatsoever of any type involving any kinds of machines and any kind of data. Um, so definiteness would uh, prescribe that kind of stuff. You'd have to say like, I'm only talking about it in this way for this kind of user and this kind of data and that type, you know. Um, I mean, those could still be crappy patents, but they would at least be less crappy, I guess. Um, so uh, we put a lot more resources for the US Patent and Trade Office to look at software patents. They already decided to a lot more resources to look at business method patents because they also tend to be kind of tricksy. And so uh, the way that that organization is budgeted and the way they manage their time, they said, well, you know, we're going to have a part in the process where we do what we call another pair of eyes. So, you know, nine hours into like I bleeding legalese on a business method patent, you start a little over to a colleague and say, I just don't know what this is anymore. Like, can you just take a look? And so, you know, uh, having two people instead of one people look at it could be good. Um, and then uh, this, I think, would be really good. Stop assuming validity. If people want patents, we can do a little more work to write them. Um, and so instead of having the onus be on the US Patent and Trade Office to prove that it's not novel and not uh, and obvious, uh, make it so that the person who is going to get the patent has to do a little bit more work to say, like, I looked in all these places and I can assure you that um, some of the other related things aren't as cool as the thing I'm trying to get a patent on or don't include this aspect. So that's, it would be tricky to figure out how to word that, but it would definitely, I think it would put the cost and the extra time in the right place. Whereas some of the other things where the taxpayer is picking up more of the bill or, you know, develop like smaller projects and developers like us, you know. So um, that's one thing. Uh, the FTC is charged with regulating trade and business and making sure business is healthy and uh, keeping monopolies from forming, that type of thing. Uh, they're well aware of the software patent problem. They wrote a 300 and some odd page paper on it in 2005 or six, and another one last year where they had lots of great suggestions, including a lot of this where it was like, fund the USPTO better, stop assuming validity, don't like encourage them with fees so that they get extra money when they grant a patent. Um, and they have a lot of graphs and charts and things if you, you know, ever find yourself in a situation where you're like, only someone really trustworthy had done a lot of work and gathered a lot of data on just how crummy this is, go get that FTC report online, 350 pages of um, depressing statistics about the software patent situation. So on a community solution, how are we doing on time here? Or I think we're all right. We have till 6 or 6.15? 6.15. Okay, great. Well, then we'll even have time for questions, which is good. So. Um, it is, I mean, it is free, but um, it actually it requires some work. So um, I just like, I, I love those weird phrases like, freedom isn't free. Like, really? What does that mean? Um, but uh, so, community solutions, I work at the Open Invention Network. Uh, we run a defensive patent pool for Linux and GNU and Android and a lot of development tools uh, that are under OSI, that's the Open Source Institute approved licenses. 
And then basically uh, everyone who has patents in that area has put them into this pool and said, we'll all cross license for free to each other so that if we get hit by an anti-competitive suit, um, it doesn't end up impacting the rest of the community. So uh, you have a, a resource that you can use to counter to it. Obviously that doesn't work for trolls because they don't make anything, so you can't really counter to them. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about how that can, that can that problem in a minute. Um, it's free to join. Let me know if you want to talk more in depth. I don't want to do the, the commercial advertising part. Um, <coughs> uh, so another um, community solution, and this is sort of what happened um, with the railroad industry. Uh, people always like to think that the stuff we're doing in software is brand new and nothing like this has ever been done before. But there was a lot of patent speculation on the railroad industry. Uh, someone uh, filed a patent for brakes on trains, but he didn't have any trains. And so eventually the railroad magnets, like they all got letters from him and were like, who is this guy? He doesn't even have any trains. And also you can't have a train without brakes. Like that's just, what the heck? So they, uh, they, they did a lot of work to identify relevant prior art between them and they worked together to do that and overturn all the patents that this person who was not a train owner had, uh, had been hitting on with. Uh, there was a similar um, thing with farm tools where uh, someone was like, where they were getting not the maker, but the user. So some uh, company uh, got a bunch of patents on common farm implements, and then they would send people out and they're like, huh, looks like you're using the new hinge on your farm gate. Uh, sure would be rough if someone came and sued you for everything you got. You could just buy a license for that hinge from me, like traveling salesman without actually selling a thing. So um, eventually, that like people organized and um, got a lot of those overturned. It turns out they uh, they were obvious and not patentable. So um, identifying relevant prior art has a good history of working uh, to stop patent speculators. Uh, the Defensive Patent License, this is in beta right now, uh, but it's this woman, Jennifer Urban, said like, well, you know, the GPL really worked to help us turn around how copyright law works. Maybe we could write a similar license to act as a GPL book for patents. And it has a hard version and a soft version, I guess, where uh, the soft version, you can put your patents in under the GPL, but then pull them back up later if you want to. Uh, and our version is supposed to be where you put them in under the DPL and they stay there forever. Um, it's still in beta. It's, it's going to be tricky to see, like, uh, this would be for anything. It would be like for any kind of patent, not just like free software patents, but anything. Uh, so it would be interesting to see how that, uh, the, you know, how the adoption goes on that. Because, like, if the adoption is just like folks with, like, very tiny projects, then, um, it's not going to be as useful as uh, if there were a lot of big projects in there. One of the reasons that the GPL is so exciting is that like the whole GNU stuff is in there and all in its kernel. You know, so people are like, oh, I want to work with that stuff. And, you know, but if you, you don't have any kind of you know, sugar in the pot, then it doesn't make you know, people want to come in. Um, and I think this is really important, continuing to build awareness and draw attention to the problem. I know that when I first started talking to people about software patents, the sort of the feedback I would get is like, oh, crime your river. Someone's suing Bill Gates, awesome. I'm like, well, yeah, but he's not the only one. And they're like, what, Steve Jobs or something? And I'm like, well, you know. So those cases tend to get a lot of press and a lot of media attention. And that uh, colors the sort of policy decisions we make. People don't think that this is affecting, you know, regular people and their ability to have jobs and build things. Then the momentum to change the problem is going to be pretty low. So, you know, if uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know if you already have a litany of political things you bring up at Thanksgiving, but maybe uh, maybe this will be less controversial than some of those other things, and you can get something done. Um, so I think building awareness and continuing to draw attention to the problem is important. Uh, these are the three papers I talked about. This uh, Colleen Chen, she wrote a lot about the um, patent speculation in railroad and uh, farm implements. 
and how she thought that might pave a way for us to look at the software patent problem. The upshot is that she recommended like targeted industry specific reform rather than giant sweeping reform. And I, I, I tend to agree. Uh, the Giant Among Us, this has more on Nathan Mervold, um, including the story where he actually, it seems like he accidentally sued himself. Um, he was named as a litigant in a case that, uh, or a company that he sits on the board of was named as a litigant in a case with a bunch of others. And then uh, uh, some journalists wrote about it and they're like, huh, it's so weird, like, that Nathan Mervold sits on the board here and it seems like this is an intellectual ventures like the Gummy Corporation. And then that company was quietly moved from the list of litigants. So he sued himself and then somebody pointed it out in print, maybe, we don't know. He never, he wouldn't go up to it first. Um, and then uh, this one has a lot of the um, stuff where a lot of the judicial solutions I talked about and how those might work and uh, what kind of precedent the court have for treating uh, patent cases in different ways, uh, industry specific ways. So uh, those are all, those are all, um, it, it's good if you want, if you read Grappa, this is a great companion piece. Uh, and then those are my picture credits, and then we're going to go to questions, because that was a huge pile of information, and I left out lots of stuff, so if you want to hear more, I'm here for you. Was that everyone's brain is full and they want to go start drinking? <laughs> I totally understand. Okay. Yes. Uh, could you give us a little background of, of how you came to the affiliation with this? Uh, what was your previous work? Uh, oh, why? How did you come to this thing for uh, calling, I guess you might say, <laughs> and, and what skills did you bring to it from whatever you did before? Sure, sure. Are you, um, are you hoping uh, you want to hire me after we fix the patent problem? I'm joking. I will tell you. Uh, my, my background is in public policy, and so um, I, I did a lot of nonprofit work, lobbying, getting candidates elected. Uh, I used to work at an environmental law office where we uh, did a lot of disputes under the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act and would file part of the court briefs. And then um, I eventually got to where I was doing more free speech and civil liberties work and ended up eventually at the Free Software Foundation doing that in the digital realm. And, um, so yeah, then I ended up kind of mashing them all back together and working on the policy pieces that affect free software. Does that answer your question thoroughly? I can tell you if you want my full life story, we'll have to do it. But um, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> a good one. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, so uh, whatever, 10,000 times 365, I expect the annual cost. Is it cheaper to buy one from Wyoming or um, You might be able to get a deal, a couple deals. My understanding of the way that process works is that you don't just buy your own, you kind of go in with a couple other folks on them. So, so yeah, yeah, like timeshare, but with the They're cheaper to rent. Yeah, that is a problem. They don't stay rented. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I, I actually have a question, but it's a question for the group. Is there anybody here who is an author or co-author of a patent or software? Okay, then what about the business methods? What was your opinion of the process and having gone through it and come out of it? What would your assessment be of the quality of software patents in here? Mine, personally, in starting my business, and I kind of went down that road thinking this is how just it is to be a grown-up business and this is what I've got to do. I found that 
texts that you got All back. The texts and the needs it was amazing what they did. It was a heck of a lot of it was a heck of a lot of work. Um, and really all I was trying to do is protect you know, protect the process. So. We um at OAN we also we help people do defensive publications if they wanna File something with the USPTO that lets them know, like, you know, hey, we we figured this out, but don't offer anyone else a patent on it. So you can have something between a patent and uh, hoping that no one finds you. Yeah, and the yeah. thing is, is how in the world, if you're a two million dollar company, you know, mm -hmm. how in the world do you you can't even run down the road? Yeah, it's it's difficult. Like one is almost the same as none. Well, that's why. You know, so a lot of these companies go around buying patents, right? So they would actually pay you for that, and then they would come to a place like IB that's, you know, right. so you have more resources to invest in. It's a numbers game for them. I mean, they have uh, relationships with at least 500 universities around the world where they get, uh, they're like just hoovering in the ideas from students and patenting them because they just, they have that kind of money. I mean, the sort of money that they're getting from damages, it's just, it's, it's, it's certainly beyond self-sustaining, so. Yeah. I, I found another question. I've actually, I've actually been um, involved very closely with people who are registering patents, mm -hmm. and just like pretty much everything in the legal system seems like a great way for lawyers to make money, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really seem like a great way for anybody but lawyers to make money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true, and, uh, and I talk to folks at companies where they're like, oh, we used to just have like one guy in legal, and now we have like a whole department down there, and I would really rather just hire more developers, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, because once they get in, and then like they have this expertise, and I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, um, but they have this very specific type of expertise, so then when you ask them, they're like, Ooh, I don't know. You always want to make sure you check with us on stuff like that. And then they just start making more work for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to point out that, that the patent system is set up so that you can represent yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it, and the language that's used is the English language in, in this case. It's true. Mm -hmm. for the number of eyes that can 
say, you know, good God, I've seen this, or I, yeah. such and such and such a company did this. The problem is you have to aggregate the witnessing of. Right. Of well, now it's kind of what I was talking about. Yeah, the prior art. World. It's just that you have to aggregate it and apply it to. In a meaningful, discernible way. Where the invalid patent exists, you have yeah. to join these things together. Government may not do a great job of it. Open source would do a better job of it. So yeah. I would love to. See, I mean, we're um, OAN is available to help anyone who wants to write up prior art or the sense of publication for Linux or Android, any of any or any of the other dev tools that are in that swath of stuff that we cover. Um, and uh, I just met someone in Austin who who wants to host a defensive publication hackathon. So, uh, and we're we're really interested in seeing how that will work because it's the U.S. has some uh, ideas about the format they'd like that information in, but I think you know we could find a good medium to produce good prior art that um, is easily searchable by them. Um, yeah, in the next year. There was a recent story about a lawyer who worked on the original Apple iPhone release um, going back and, and, and submitting a patent for touch screen technology. Mm -hmm. so they could later come back and sue Apple for having owned the patent on touch screen technology. Yeah. And what interested me, among other things, about this story was that they actually went back later and clarified the patent further. They, they made changes to it so that it was more inclusive of what Apple had developed. So what is the process by which you can take a patent that you've already submitted and say, well, I want to make it different and more like this now? I didn't, I didn't know such a thing was possible. I'm not sure what that's called, but I'll find out. Um, we, have, we have attorneys on staff mm -hmm. that know all of those well, things. So. The pharma companies use that process because they're like, um, yeah. Will Butrin mm -hmm. is. Oh, right. It might be part of the extension process, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that yeah. might be what it is. a long acting version of your drug, you get 70 years of it. Yeah. Because you, you modify the patents and the process over. Right. Yeah, so that was part of like the maintenance fees and, and the patent fees. You that's if you're willing to pay, then you can do more. But yeah, so it sounds like that's part of the extension process. But I'll check and find out. Um, do people have other questions? Yeah, in the back. So one of the big problems uh, with software patents, particularly with Foxwell, is that they are just very prevalent in a lot of the uh, standards. Mm -hmm. This is why you see, for example, distributions like the Gore and Rosex that Debian can't ship anything MPEG or a couple of other things. Uh, that, that because they, we have these big patent pools that exist within, they're not officially part, like for example, MPEG LA is not officially part of MPEG, but it includes pretty much everyone in MPEG who made the format that MPEG has adopted. Right. If you want to use any of the MPEG stuff, you got to pay these MPEG LA people. Mm -hmm. And we basically, as an industry, allow this process to continue because as the standard organization's patent policies were originally written, the idea is that you cannot simply, uh, you cannot charge uh, for royalties for any one person different than another. Now, this problem worked fine until the world of clocks came along where you have this giant difficult problem of, well, now you can have all these different derivatives going down the line, and mm -hmm. maybe all these people who can't pay for one reason or another, and it gets kind of to be a bit of a mess. So my question is this, how difficult would it be to change the policies of these standard organizations so that they more align with, say, something that, what the W3C has had since inception, where, yes, you can have patents because it's probably unlikely we're gonna get any patent-free standardized in the future, but if you wish to be part of the standard, you need to license under everyone royalty-free irrevocably. Yeah, that would be great to see. Uh, the patent tickets are their own kind of special problem, which is different than patent trolls. Like the MPLA is probably the most famous that you were talking about. And um, so having the standards 
be patentable or for all intents and purposes because everything using the standard is patentable uh, is really, really dangerous, I think, and, and bad. Um, I'm not sure, like, policy-wise, how we would go about that. Uh, the FRAND and RAND, which is supposed to be, like, fair use, but for functionality, um, is pretty weak in the U.S., so that might be the right place to look as far as uh, beefing up what we consider kind of fair use for uh, standards. But, um, yeah, that is, a, that is almost its own whole can of worms uh, because of the, the, like, that really targeted standards uh, and uh, getting patents around the standards. And they now have plenty of money because people pay them royalties to use all the things. Um, there are other countries that enforce the fair use piece um, more robustly, so we could model on that, I guess, is, the, is a not super specific answer. But, sorry. Yeah? Fair use is a term that comes from the trademark. So right. It's not. It's, I'm sorry. It's not the fair use. Like, uh, it's not the. It's not the actual term fair use in that way. It's. It's. It's the thing that is analogous to fair use for patent law. Or it's the idea. Yeah. So Paul asked about who has all the patents. So I have sort of a little anecdote. I, mean, I don't know if this handles, but um, at one point I worked for a large cable company that wanted to patent one of the things I. Uh huh. And uh, I wasn't a Latino software patent at the time, so I just didn't do anything with it. <laughs> I mean, I had my performance and stuff, but I never turned it back into legal. Mm -hmm. You know, and honestly, management doesn't care that much. And eventually, I got I left, and they went next round. So you know, there's probably one less software patent. Right? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it's kind of a civil disobedience almost, but it's the same kind of employee disobedience. But you know, I mean, the lawyers aren't going to write things without engineers cooperating. With yeah, that's a, uh, yes. Um, I apologize for uh, giving the third time here, but I want to point out that IBM, and this applies to your situation to some extent, um, uh, the, anything that's not made public that you really think could be patentable uh, doesn't really have any traction in, in uh, removing other people uh, from the opportunity to and so if, 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 assuming you think like others, well, let's just say that IBM as a large corporation used to maintain one of the largest databases of ideas that you could find. Mm -hmm. Second, only through the patent office, IBM was the place to go for all kinds of things that had been published. And it was, IBM maintained it simply so that they couldn't be locked out by somebody else. And they, they knew, well, we're only IBM, mm -hmm. other people think like us. The sooner we publish it, we don't have time to bother patenting it, but we don't want to be locked out from it. So, so we want to publish it, and it's just an open idea. It's, it's, it's rather close to the concept of open source. You know, mm -hmm. it's just here's an idea. We want to, if we want to do it someday, we don't want anybody standing in our way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you should do that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, that's it's, the it's prior art is the way to. It's yeah. the same problem that, that I spoke to earlier. Yeah. There's no good databases that are maintained, highly organized, and mm -hmm. highly linked with you know, cross links to uh, address what we really know. A lot of people know anecdotally from their experiences that such and such a company was doing this and talked publicly and openly, openly with this other company at such and such a time. And the problem is that the records are not published anywhere. The witnesses are invisible. Right. So that that's what the prior art is about. And um, the portal that we use at OAN is called LinuxDefenders.org. To LinuxDefenders.org, and that's the place that we're um, asking people to submit prior art around Linux and GNU and things like that. Um, and so I would, if you have something that you'd like to put in there, that would be awesome. Or if you want help writing it, I'm happy to help. Um, I think I have time for just one more question, if anyone had anything else. Um, don't ask me about ongoing legal disputes, because we're on the same page, but, okay. All right, thanks very much.
enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch. 
where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. 
The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.